Hi, I'm Danilo. I'm part of the developer relations team in AWS and welcome to this session. I'm the first speaker. Here, we're going to show you a few ways you can uh, analyze time series data on AWS and we'll specifically show how you can do real-time analytics and also how you can connect your time series data with non-time series data from other business systems like your customer database or your order management system using a data lake. The reason why we decided to create this session is that time series data is everywhere. If we look at the log of any application, you have a timestamp and some event that happened in that application, and that's a time series. And often, for example, DevOps application try to connect and correlate different logs, so different time series from multiple applications. Also, time series is very popular with IoT application where sensors send us data of what happens in the world of, or of what happens in a specific a shop or a factory. And also, uh, in a gaming environment, if you create a multiplayer game, you want to receive a, a stream of events, a time series that describes how the, your players are doing, what are they experiencing in your game to improve the, the, the game and also to understand if someone found a way to cheat and, and be faster or stronger than the other players in the game. And strangely enough, even if time series are everywhere, uh, they're not handled well by traditional databases. So for example, relational databases normally are very inefficient in storing, loading a lot of time series data and analyzing this data. And uh, often they, uh, they're not easy because you have a, a rigid schema to handle and if you change the data, that's not easy to handle. And also they often lack some integration with higher analytics tools like machine learning. For this reason, many specific time series solution came out uh, over the years, but Often they still are difficult to manage at scale uh, or they uh, are quite complex to handle in, in uh, the, the life cycle of your data. So often you, have, you end up having two different repositories, one for live data and one for the data that you want to store for a longer period. And connecting these two repositories is not easy. For that reason, we created Amazon Timestream uh, that is a, a serverless fully managed uh, time series database uh, that is super easy to use. You don't need to set up a server, install, uh, software, patch it, uh, manage the indexes. Uh, it's designed to be very performant at any scale, so you can load 10 records per day or trillions of data daily and it will just automatically scale up and down and handle the workload. Uh, and it's uh, also its SQL capability are designed to automatically handle data that is stored in memory and data that is stored on a, a magnetic store so that any query automatically spans all the data that you have in a table. Uh, independently from the repository that you choose. And it's also designed to analyze time series with advanced functions, like functions that allows you to uh, compute interpolation or smooth the data in a way that make it easier for, for their analytics to work on the same data. And it's designed to be secure uh, from the start. So uh, all data at, uh, at rest, for example, and also all data in transit, it's encrypted by, encrypted by default. So if you have a time series data source, so it can be a game, multiplayer game, it can be uh, an IoT architecture, it can be your DevOps application sending you the logs, uh, you can load this directly to TimeStream. It will automatically scale up if you have a lot of data to ingest. Uh, and then you can use the SQL interface to query your data. Uh, for example, using a business intelligence tool like Amazon QuickSight, you can uh, uh, analyze and look at the data and understand what is happening with your data. Uh, but what happens if you want, for example, to do some specific, very complex analytics in real time? Uh, well, you can plug in other tools from AWS. For example, you can use Amazon Kinesis. Uh, with Kinesis, you can write your data into a Kinesis stream, uh, and um, you can go do it directly, or if you have an IoT application, you can go to AWS IoT core that will maybe simplify the integration with some native IoT protocols and will also uh, make it easier to handle credentials with certificates. And once data is in a Kinesis data stream, you can use Kinesis Data Analytics uh, that gives you a fully managed uh, um, uh, Apache Flink environment to run your real-time analytics. Uh, for example, you can use the complex event processing component of Apache Flink to look for patterns in your data, and then write the output in another Kinesis stream. And then you can use, for example, Lambda functions to load this data into a uh, time stream table into one where you have your raw data and another one where you have a smaller set of data that is computed through the Apache Flink platform. And 
then you can analyze this data also with tools like Grafana. In this presentation, we'll use uh, Amazon Managed Grafana, but it's exactly the same. Uh, and with Grafana, you can uh, create dashboards that are updated very quickly, and you can also uh, set up notification if something happens to be notified very quickly. Uh, if you really need speed, you can also send a notification directly from the Lambda function that is doing the upload of the, uh, of the, of the data on, on, on time stream. What happens if you need to join this time series data with the, the data from your application, so your customer database, your order management? Well, one way to do that is to use a tool like Apache Airflow to extract via query data from the time stream database and store it in an efficient format like Apache Parquet in your data lake on S3. Uh, here, I'm going to use, uh, again, the fully managed version of Apache Airflow that we, uh, that we have, but the configuration that will be shown later work also with the complete uh, with, with the standard open source version. And uh, all the uh, information of the schema of the data lake will be stored on uh, the AWS Blue data catalog so that they can be integrated with everything that is stored in your data lake. For the first part of this presentation, uh, I'm going to focus on the ingestion part. Uh, data ingestion is where data is loaded from a data generator that I wrote using some Python code into the Kinesis platform. And then we will see how we can use uh, Kinesis Data Analytics with Apache Flink and Lambda to load this data into time stream. And we'll also have a glimpse of uh, the advanced uh, time series capability of uh, the SQL functions that time series provide. So let's start with the demo. First, I connect to the EC2 instance uh, where I installed the uh, Python script that is generating random data in input for my time series. This is the random data generator.py script. And here I also have a small uh, utility script that will start this generator in the background. Let's look at the source code of the script. So uh, I start by uh, uh, using the name of the CloudFormation stack to uh, uh, look at the output of the CloudFormation stack and get the name of the input uh, Kinesis data stream. In this way, I don't need to hard code it into the, into the, uh, the script, the generation script. This function is generating random data for uh, the, the sensors by ID. I use IDs between 0 and 99. Uh, and here I generate a random temperature between 10 and 180 Fahrenheit. Uh, if the temperature is high, uh, then there is a higher probability to have an error or warning state status, uh, otherwise the status is okay. And in output, I return the full record with the sensor ID, the temperature, the status, and most importantly, the, the, the event time. So this is the, the, the timestamp that I use for, uh, for the time series. Uh, and then uh, to generate data for uh, 100 sensors, I loop into uh, the IDs from 0 to 99. And to simulate uh, a possible network issues, uh, each sensor uh, has the 50% chance to skip one iteration and don't send data for one iteration. And to fast things up in the demo, I send data every second, so I sleep for one second. Uh, but in production, probably you are going to send data from uh, something, maybe every minute or something like that. It really depends on how fast you, you need to be. Uh, Given this, let's see uh, how what we are actually building. So uh, to build the, the, the architecture here for uh, ingesting data, so two input streams, two Lambda functions uh, that load the data into two uh, time stream uh, tables, uh, I use uh, the AWS CDK. So if we go here, there is a CDK directory where there is the time series and data lake uh, construct that is generating, it's actually building uh, the input kinesis stream, uh, the uh, complex event processing stream that is output of the uh, kinesis analytics part. Uh, I create the time stream database, uh, the uh, two tables, the row table and the uh, 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 complex event processing table uh, where I can specify different kind of retention between the data that is kept in memory and data that is kept into the uh, 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 magnetic store for retention. Here I uh, load the data from the uh, two uh, kinesis streams into time stream. Since these two functions are very similar, I created a single uh, CDK construct that I call 
called uh, from KDS to time stream, from Kinesis data stream to time stream. And here I give a name and then as a parameter the, in the stream to, to load the data from and the time stream uh, database and table to write the data from the stream to. And this is the construct that I created. Uh, it's very nice feature. It's a very nice feature of K of CDK to to create this construct that enables you to uh, reuse components that are of a higher level than uh, raw infrastructure components. So in this case, this construct includes a lambda function uh, whose code is uh, is here in the load data fn uh, directory. Uh, in input in the uh, environment of the function, I pass the name and the, the, of the database and the and the database uh, table. Uh, here I add uh, the permission to the functions to write record to the specific table uh, it needs to write to. Uh, I also give permission to the function to uh, use the time stream describe endpoints uh, API. This is used for writing because time stream is highly scalable for data injection, so you can describe multiple endpoints and then uh, the, 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 uh, the AWS SDK will spread the data load uh, onto these uh, endpoints. And uh, finally, I configure the event source, so the input for the Lambda function will be the uh, Kinesis stream that I passed in input. So this will create this architecture. So what is still missing is the uh, data analytics part. So let's go uh, to the console. So if we go into the uh, uh, Kinesis console, we see that we have now the two streams, the input stream is here, and what you can do to analyze the data uh, from an input uh, from a Kinesis stream, you can go into the process uh, button here and select process data in real time. And this will uh, quickly start either a, a studio notebook uh, with a fully managed uh, Apache Flink environment, or you can start a, a streaming application that you already created. So I already created the notebook. So we can go into the Kinesis uh, Analytics console and open the uh, Apache uh, Zeppelin uh, notebook. And here I have the time series note. So first I created a, a, a table that I call sensor data that will get in input the data from the uh, input stream, uh, the Kinesis input stream. And if I select data from this uh, table, currently there is nothing because uh, I'm not sending data at the moment. Uh, all the, the information of the table uh, that I create from uh, Kinesis Data Analytics here is stored into the AWS Glue Data Catalog. So you can see there is the Sensors Data Table and another table that we'll create, we'll create shortly after. Now there is the uh, output table. So I want to process this input stream uh, and look for complex events, uh, like sequences of events that give me a some pattern that I want to uh, analyze more. And to do so, I'm using the complex event processing component of uh, uh, Apache Flink. So this is the, the, the syntax. So first, I created an output table, uh, CEP data, that is writing into the output uh, stream. Then I, uh, use, I, I generate this insert into this uh, CEP data table uh, as a select from the input table, the census data table. And I use the match recognize keyword to use the uh, complex event processing component of Apache Flink. Uh, I want data to be partitioned by sensor ID because I want to look into a sequence of a sp for each specific sensor. Uh, I order data by processing time. Uh, processing time is an additional field that I added uh, in the, to the sensors data uh, using the proc time function when I created the table. Uh, this is a second. Uh, sort of time series that I have on top of the event time that I get in input, but it's usually interesting to, to have both because one tells you when the data was generated and one when the data has been processed. Uh, the measures keyword will tell me you know, what, what kind of tells you what kind of uh, data you want to select and insert into the, the output table. Uh, let's keep it for this, but let's look at the pattern. So what you can do with this uh, match recognized keyword is to look into a sequence of events that is somehow interesting. In this case, I have these sensors sending me temperature and status. And what I find strange if this sensor is in error uh, and then goes back to working normally and then goes back to error, uh, an error again very quickly. This is like a strange behavior for me. So I look into a pattern where I have a sequence of events. A is the first event of the pattern. 
C is the last event of the pattern. This is the same sensor because I partitioned by sensor ID. And in the middle, I have uh, the B events that are one up to five, look into the numbers between the curly brackets. Uh, and event A, the first event is with status error. Event C, the last one, has a status error. And the event in between, that is one to five, have a status that is not an error, so maybe okay or warning. And when, when I have this sequence, uh, that should come between uh, 10 minutes, between the first and the last event. Uh, I want to select the event time. I want to count how many non-errors there are. So I count asterisk here will give me the full number of the events in the pattern. So there's one and uh, two events, the first and the last, and one to five in, the, in between. So I remove two, event A and event C. So I'm only counting the number of the B events, the non-errors. Uh, then I look into the value of the status of these B events. And since there, are, can, there is a dynamic number of them, I use the first function to take the, the first, the second, uh, and so on. Uh, the first as uh, ID zero, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, this uh, function will return the value of the status if the B event exists. But if I have less than five, uh, I will get some null in return from the first function. So I use the concat underscore WS function to ignore the, the null values uh, and then to con concatenate all the results uh, with a dash. This will create a sort of a history of the non-errors that are between errors, something like OK, dash, warning, uh, and so on. And we'll see the value shortly. Uh, then I get, uh, I select some numerical value. So I get the minimum, the average, and the maximum value of the temperature for these events. And then I round uh, in seconds the difference in time between the first and the last event, so C and A, uh, to see how much time elapsed, what is the lapse time between the, uh, the first and the last event in the sequence. So this is just an example of what you can do with this functionality. It's really interesting because you get these results very quickly. So to see how quickly, let's start the input uh, here. So we still don't have anything in the table. So let's go back to the uh, uh, to the uh, EC2 instance and let's start the, the, the generator. And now I can uh, look into the, uh, the value that is being sent. So I'm sending a sequence of values like this where I sensor, sensor ID 40, this is the temperature, this is the status, and this is the event time. And I have some errors and some warnings in the stream. I mean, sending data every second, probably in production, you, you, you don't send data so quickly, but it's useful to speed up the demo. So if we go back in the Kinesis uh, not, uh, in, uh, analytics uh, notebook, we see that data is, being, is arriving here, uh, similar to the one that I saw, and we also have the processing time. And let's start the, uh, the, the query here. And in a matter of few seconds, we will see the, the, the output uh, in the CEP data uh, table. And here is the, uh, the output. You see I have for each sensor uh, a time series with the event time with a certain number of non-errors between two errors. So this is the full history that I get, like a sequence of OK and warning state. And then the minimum, average, and maximum temperature and the elapsed time in seconds between the, last, the first and the last error. So this is something that uh, I can also configure as an application. So if I take only this cell, I can go here in the, in the notebook and I can say I build and export this uh, as an application. And when this building, this uh, uh, build is finished, I can deploy the application as a Kinesis data analytics application. In the meantime, the Lambda functions are uploading the data from the uh, input stream into the row table and the output of this complex event processing uh, stream into the uh, CEP table in time stream. Uh, just a quick look at the architecture. So these two Lambda functions are uploading the output of the two streams, including the one that is processing the data in, uh, in data anal uh, analytics. So let's go into the query editor. And here we can see the, the value in this table. So this is a, just a select of the first uh, 
uh, items into the row table. So this is what I expect, no sensor, status, measure, temperature and time and the value of the measure. And if I go into the uh, CP table, I will get the similar values. Uh, but that has been splitted. So for each, since I can have uh, a single measure uh, for each record in time stream, uh, the different measures from a, a, a single input record have been splitted by the lambda function into multiple multiple measures. So for example, for this sensor at this point in time, I have the minimum average, the max uh, uh, and max. Uh, temperature and the elapsed time, uh, and I use the the, the history the, the, as a as a uh, as a dimension for the record. Let's do something more interesting. So what I want to do is to interpolate the data to fill the gaps that happen because sometimes, as we saw in the generator, uh, uh, the data is being skipped by some of the sensors. So to do so, I have to transform the flat data model that is the normal uh, data into the time stream tables into a time series, and I use the create time series uh, function, and I transform both the value of the measure, so the temperature, and the value of the status into a time series. And this is the output that you get if you run this function. So you get something like, uh, for a specific sensor ID, uh, I have two time series uh, with uh, the value of uh, of the temperature or uh, of the status for uh, as, it, as it's being sent by the sensor. And since some values are skipped, you see that I have different values for each sensor. So here I have 23, here I have 16. Uh, it depends on how many values have been skipped. I want to smooth these this, this values and I want to uh, make them fill the gaps. So I can, now that I, data is in a time series format, I can use the interpolate functions in time stream to fill the gaps. So for the temperature, I use interpolate linear. That is uh, using a sequence with interval of one second. Again, this is the speed of my demo, but you can use, for example, maybe one minute. Uh, and uh, I will. Uh, this will transform this into a time series. This is time series into a time series that has uh, no gaps, and it will be smoothed when there is a gap with uh, a linear interpolation. For uh, the status. I'm using something similar, but since this is not a number, I use the last observation carried forward, LOCF. So the last status that I receive will be repeated un until I receive a new status from a, from, a, from a sensor to fill the gaps. And if I run this uh, query, uh, it will output the, uh, this is just for the last minute, by the way, uh, it will output the, the values of the, since this is a minute, it's slightly less than uh, 60 observation, and you see there are no gaps here. Every second exactly I have a value, and the value also a little bit smoothened up. And if I go here again, I see the, the last value carried forward, so I have an okay status uh, everywhere here, and probably if I look a little bit more, in this case I have two errors uh, and then uh, some okay uh, status. So this is something very clean. I interpolated, I filled the gaps, uh, uh, but to export this data, I want to put the data back from time series format into the flat format of time stream. So I use uh, the unnest function to do so. So first I take the same query that I used uh, in the example before, and I uh, call it interpolated time series. And then from the result of this query, I run another select that will unnest the two time series, uh, and then will uh, join the value by time, because I have currently two time series, so I need to correlate them. And this is group, data is grouped by sensor ID and time. And, uh, and for each record, I want the sensor ID, the time, uh, the status, and the temperature. Since status and temperature are not value that, uh, values that I'm grouping by, uh, I need to put some aggregation function here, but actually I already know that for a specific sensor and a specific point in time, I only have one value for the status and one value for the temperature. So the fact that I take the minimum of the uh, status or the average of the temperature is just a trick uh, that needs to uh, I need to do to respect the SQL syntax because status and temperature are not in the group by statement. And now I run the query again, and we should get in output a very clean and smooth. Uh, 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 table where I have for each second exactly I have uh, in each sensor I have the status the temperature with no gaps and this is something that I can analyze so from a SQL perspective uh, time stream has all the capabilities you need so you can connect 
uh, an external tool to do business intelligence or build dashboards. Uh, but sometimes you want to connect this data uh, with non-time series data, like your customer structure. Maybe your customers, some, uh, each customer is using some of these sensors and you want to aggregate data at customer level. So to join time series data with non-time series data, uh, is you can export this uh, and, uh, into uh, another repository. And this is something that we will see in the next part of this presentation. So we've seen how the data injection part of this demo works. Now let's see how we can extract data from time string and put it into our data lake. And to do that, I'll pass it over to Ricardo. Thank you, Danilo, for that. And uh, now that we've got some useful queries for our time series data, how do we make those available within our data lake and our analytic workflows? So in this part of the demo, what we're going to show you is how we can orchestrate the exporting of that time series data into our data lakes using those queries that um, Danilo so helpfully um, put together for us. Now, for the purpose of the demo, we're going to use five minute intervals, but typically you would do this over a longer period, say 60 minutes in your own uh, environments. We're going to go over um, uh, how we can use Apache Airflow to do this, and we're going to provision uh, an instance of managed workflows for Apache Airflow, which is a managed um, version of Apache Airflow, and we're going to provision that using uh, CDK. Now, we're going to use an open source project called AWS Data Wrangler to interact with that time series data. Um, as there's no Apache Airflow operators at the moment, that um, uh, we could do that directly. Uh, and then we're going to create some workflow, some DAGs, uh, using uh, the queries that Danilo gave us and Data Wrangler, um, and show how we can use those to create those exports into our data lake. And then we're going to trigger that over these five minute intervals, and you will see the data coming through into our data lake. And then finally, once the data and the files are there, we're then going to use AWS Glue, and we're going to create a crawler, which will configure and create the database and tables in the um, AWS Glue so that Athena um, uh, will be able to pick that up and we'll be able to incorporate the time series data in uh, our queries in our data lake. So let's come out of the presentation and let's walk through the code and the demo. So this is the query that we're interested in from Danilo and we're going to use one of the features of the Amazon Time Screen Query Language which is interpolation to make sure that we fill in any of the gaps that might have been dropped by the ingestion uh, within time stream from the sensors okay so this is the query we want to run but we want to run it uh, as a basis for the data in our data lake now we could do this a number of ways um, but typically organizations use some kind of uh, automation or orchestrator to do this and for the purpose of this demo we're going to use uh, a very common open source uh, or a workflow orchestrator called apache airflow now aws has a managed service of this called managed workflows for apache airflow or moi for short and so we're going to use and show you how to configure and install and use that to run queries that take the data from time stream and then put it into our data lake. Now I want to, I want to use a, a really cool open source project, which you may or may not have heard of called AWS Data Wrangler. And this makes it super easy to work with data types on AWS of all different kinds, including time stream data. Now, Apache Airflow um, is a workflow orchestrator you create and define tasks, uh, sorry, workflow that contain uh, one or more tasks. And those workflows are actually written in Python. So it's a good combination of using Data Wrangler and Apache Airflow to achieve this. So we need to have an Apache Airflow environment uh, for us to use. Uh, now, it's super easy to get started by configuring one of those in the console. Uh, um, but we're going to use AWS CDK to do that. Um, and uh, if I show you the code, um, but actually, which we can see um, in the repository. If I go here, the code for this is in the moi folder. And um, we have uh, the um, three stacks that make up this application. Um, and we define variables to make sure that we don't have to hard code these values, which means you can reuse this for any number of different environments. So we have a back end uh, stack which configures all the networking. Uh, which is a requirement for the uh, MOA service. We then have an environment stack which configures actually the Apache Airflow itself. And then we have a file deploy stack which deploys all the workflows that we're going to use that use um, Data Wrangler to write queries and export those into our data lake. 
we're going to copy those using a different stack. Um, now, the we could have built this into the uh, first CDK stack that Zinlog used to create the time stream database. Uh, sometimes it's useful, however, to separate out into different stacks. For example, if you've got um, uh, or want to use this for other types of um, Apache Airflow environments that might not be related to time stream, for example. So in this instance, I've got I've separated it out, but we're taking some of the information that's output from the initial uh, time stream CDK app, and we're going to use that within this. So here. For example, the two things we're going to use is the location of the data, data lake, the data lake bucket, as well as the time stream IAM on. And we want to use those because we want to make sure that the permissions we have within Apache Airflow are the lowest possible um, and they're scoped only to access the data they should be accessing rather than any data. Uh, so we're going to use those, incorporate those um, in this environment. And then we define some Apache Airflow environments that are common to all Apache Airflow environments, which is a S3 bucket, which we use to deploy the code, um, the name of an environment, as well as um, how we want to prefix integration into AWS Secrets Manager. Now, this one is optional, but what I've done is I've created this so that we can copy some data into that uh, that we can use in our workflows themselves, which means we don't have to hard code our workflow. So we can reuse our workflows for multiple different time stream data sources uh, or queries, um, and that makes it super, super nice to do that. Um, so we deploy um, uh, this using the standard uh, um, uh, way of, of deploying um, stacks, CDK, LS to C stacks, and then CDK deploy. So the order here is you deploy the VPC one first, then the deploy, and then the env. Um, and those are the, that's the order in which we deploy them. And you can actually see the, when we, when we do that, we get um, the uh, stacks in CloudFormation. The output of it will be to create a new um, uh, managed airflow, managed workflows for Apache Airflow environment, which we can click on here. We can see all the configuration values we've set, and then we can click on this link to get to the UI. And you should see this, here, although what you will see is you will see the, um, all the workflows currently in paused state. That deploy stack deploys all the files from this directory. Uh, which are our workflows. So let's take a look actually at the workflows um, that we've got here. And there's two really um, of, of interest. The first one is just running the query itself and exporting the data into our data lake. And um, as you can see, it looks like a standard Python file. We're importing various libraries, including you'll notice the data wrangler. Um, Apache Airflow has a number of operators to work either with languages like Python or Bash, but also some AWS services. Now, there's no current operator for uh, TimeStream, which is why we have to use something like Data Wrangler. Uh, we then create some default arguments uh, for our workflow. Um, we're then going to grab some variables from AWS Secrets Manager. Now, what I've done is I've used the CLI to put these um, values in here so we can see this particular one, the time series uh, raw table, is the name of the table. But if I go back, um, we can see that we've got the um, database um, and the, 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 the uh, glue, crawler, a group, glue crawler I am role. OK, we can see that. Um, uh, so so we, we, we do that so we don't have to hard code the um, DAGs. Um, then we define a function within this uh, DAG, which is actually going to do the query. So we get a start and finish date. And here we're using some specific um, values within Apache Airflow. Um, Apache Airflow, when it's working on a schedule, records the start and end of every single um, scheduled um, uh, iteration. And we can use that as the parameters and the bounding for our queries to make sure our queries are independent which means that every time you run them, it'll always get the same output. And that's really important because one of the really cool features of Apache Airflow is this thing called backfill, which means you can run your um, tasks, pass in some date parameters, and then it will go back and then the scheduler will fill in all the slots with that start and end time and rerun the queries. Now, why would you want to do that? Um, I can hear you start asking me. Well, what if you wanted to subtly change the query or maybe you had some problems uh, upstream and you want to need to rerun everything. Well, that's when um, the Apache Airflow backfill can be super useful. So once we've done that, we then create a folder 
um, uh, and we use the time and date uh, as the uh, structure for that folder. So again, to make sure it's, everything is interpotent, we want to make sure that all the, all the data is kept uh, nicely partitioned out. We then have that same query that uh, we started off with um, that Danilo passed on to us. Um, and here we're just substituting those values into that query. Um, here we then actually run the data wrangler, data wrangler query. So we've got uh, data wrangler S3 to CSV. So here what we're doing is we're passing the query um, to this method um, that's basically going to copy that data to S3 in CSV format. Um, if I wanted to, I could use Parquet as well. Um, once I've got that um, function, I now actually create my workflow. And my workflow has got, again, some standard uh, Apache Airflow parameters. We give it a name. We pass in those default arg uh, uh, arguments. Um, uh, and we then um, uh, do a um, schedule. So here it's every five minutes, but I've, you can see I've got some other examples there. And then we actually kick off the um, task itself. So here we define that the task TS query is going to use a Python operator, that we're going to use the function, the Python function uh, that I just, this one here, um, and the, value, the, the, the values um, that we defined for the DAG. And that's it. And if we go back to the UI and we have a look at this one, this is what it looks like, just one task. When we run it, if I enable it, we should see that kickoff straight away. We'll see that it's going to run a query. And we can see that basically it's processed um, and it's actually done a query and exported it into our data lake. Um, and we can see the folder it's done that in. So let's have a look at um, that folder. So it's 55. Let's refresh this page. Uh, at the end, and we can see this is the folder. And if we look in here, we can see this is the file. There we go. We can see it's in the same kind of format that we expect. Okay, so we've now got that um, running. But that um, all, all we've done so far is um, run the query, so it puts the files into S3. What we now need to do is now we now have to configure um, a crawler in AWS Glue so that it can add that um, so that it's available in uh, Amazon Athena uh, and other uh, data sources. So what we do is we've got another um, workflow here, which takes exactly the same, um, uh, it looks exactly the same as the previous one. But what we've done is we've added a new operator. This one does exist in Apache Airflow. It's the AWS Glue crawl operator. Um, and we create a new, uh, actually we do a couple of things. First of all, we've got we've grabbed another value from uh, the Secrets Manager, which is the glue uh, I am role we need. And then we create a new task. So this one's called run crawler using that operator. Um, we give it an ID. Um, and then some of this is standard default um, uh, parameters. We give it a name, a role, which we pass in that value. We give it a database name, a description, and then we specify the targets, i.e. that the data lake. And when we do this, it creates a crawler, which I think is here. We go to crawlers. Yep. So here's the crawler, that one there. We can see that's the data there. And what that will do is it will run after the, the um, file's been copied. Uh, actually, it might have, is it running? No, it's not running anymore. Um, and when we go to Athena, um, if we click on refresh here, we can see that this data now exists here. You can see this is the last five minutes worth of data. So you can see that that data is now available for Javier to do all his magic um, uh, in a moment. Now, one thing to, um, to point out, when we configure um, our um, Apache Airflow environment using the stack, let's have a look at that stack, um, which is this one here. So, we have um, within the actual configuration. Um, this is this is the this, uh, the, the actual um, uh, block of code that configures the actual um, uh, Apache Airflow environment. You'll notice here that we actually have a requirements.txt file. Um, now, Data Wrangler isn't available on the worker nodes for Apache Airflow, and so we have to make that available. And within uh, the managed workflows for Apache Airflow, the way we do that is by defining all the libraries we need in a requirements.txt file and then configuring that when we configure our environment. If we take a look at what that file looks like, it's a standard requirements file. Now, AWS Wrangler requires a couple of other libraries as well. 
And what this means is that when um, the Apache Airflow environment is provisioned and configured, these will um, uh, be installed. And every time a worker node is spun up, those libraries will be available. And then the data wrangler is available for me to use within my tasks. If I didn't have this in here, I'd get a module import error or module not available error. So that's really, it's a really important um, uh, thing to, to, to bear in mind if you want to add some additional functionality or capabilities that's not part of the standard um, Apache Airflow um, uh, operators. Um, and um, so I think that's, that's pretty much the demo done. We can see that this is going to be running every five minutes. If we look at the actual um, uh, timeline, we can see here that this has been running every five minutes. Um, and we can see that also in the um, folders here, we can see that in the fact that all the folders have got five minute gaps in between time. So with that, uh, now that we've got the data in Amazon Athena, over to you have a to do your analytics magic. Thank you, Ricardo and Danilo. Now I have everything I need to create my demo and present the last part of the presentation. So with all the data already on time stream, on two tables, one for the raw data and one for the complex event pattern we detected, and with all the data on the data lake, I can already proceed to, the, to do more visual analytics because so far we've seen just queries and so on. But very often you want to put that on a panel, on a dashboard. And for that, we have two different ways. We can work with real-time interactive visualizations with Grafana, with Amazon Managed Grafana, or we can do more business-like analytics with Amazon QuickSight. And the most interesting part is that since with Airflow, Ricardo was exporting data from time stream into S3, I'm going to be able to query data not only on time stream, but I'm going to be able to join the data with data I have on my data lake. In particular, on my uh, example, I have some customer data on my data lake, and I'm going to be joining that data with the data from time stream to get more actionable business insight. So let's go to it. Uh, when I'm speaking about dashboards, about real-time dashboards, this is what I'm talking about. This is a Grafana dashboard. And as you can see here, I have metrics that are changing over time, too many things going on, and it looks interesting. That's, you know, that's what I can tell you. But let's take a step back. How did I get here? Well, if you were around reInvent last year, you may have heard the announcement that we were launching Amazon Managed Grafana, which is just the open source Grafana managed by AWS. With open source Grafana, you can do powerful interactive data visualizations. So if you want to use open source Grafana, you can use it. And we have the time stream plugin you can install with instructions on the documentation, but it's more convenient to use the managed version so you can forget about many things. Before I did this session, I created a workspace. A workspace is just uh, the, the set of users that are going to be able to access some particular uh, dashboards. So I created the workspace. And the thing that I did, apart from using the defaults, was adding as a data source time stream. Because when you start, when you start Grafana, you have just some default plugins. If you want to use time stream, you need to install the plugin. But if you're using Manage Grafana, you can just tell, hey, I want to use this plugin. It will be automatically deployed. You don't have to worry about anything. So now I have the plugin installed on my dashboard. I can just go there and I can start working with the data. The first step to be able to do any analytics is to configure the data sources. That is the connection to your tables, and you know where the data lives. In my particular case, I'm going to be querying data uh, just from time stream. So I created beforehand a couple of time stream data sources. It's very simple as you will see now. So if I create a new time stream data source, it's going to ask me a couple of things. In which region I am working, which database I'm going to be using. I have a few, so I'm going to be using this one, which is the, the same Ricardo was using. And which table I'm going to be using. In this particular uh, case, I'm using the time series row table. And what is the default measure? So that will be the configuration 
for my data source, okay? And I did exactly the same for the time series uh, CAP complex severe patterns database. So I have exactly the same information. So with that out of the way, I can already compose a dashboard. So if I go to my dashboards, you can see here I have a lot of different charts, a lot of different widgets. Here on top, I'm displaying the uh, data coming from the CEP table, all the events detected with the details, and here just the maximum temperature detected at each of these events. The rest of the of the uh, charts are displaying data coming from the row table. So here I have the row temperature readings. Here I have the uh, different number of events with the status, the percentiles, average uh, 90% and 75% percentile of the temperatures, all the temperatures, the maximum temperature I've seen for each sensor in this interval. Now I have it in 15 minutes, I'm going to change to five, for example. And here I have the maximum temperature in the past 10 seconds for the sensor, and that's about it. So that, that's basically the information I have. So how, how do I work with this? Well, when you create a new chart, in my case, I'm going just to edit a new one. You have to choose a couple of things. First, of course, the kind of chart, the type of visualization. In this case, I'm using a time series visualization. Depending on the type of visualization, you can change some things. For example, you can change uh, how thick is the line or the type of the line, or uh, you know, if, if you're going to be using just points rather than lines, whatever works better for your particular visualization. But more importantly, I have to choose which is the data source. In my case, I'm using for this the uh, row, the row table for the time series, and which is the measure I'm going to be using. And then I have to run my query. So here, what I'm saying is like, I want to read all the data, order by time. And if you notice here, I have a weird condition. What this means? Well, on the time stream plugin for Grafana, we have a few macros. So we have a macro, which represents the current database, a macro which represents the current interval in Grafana, a macro that represents the current table, and one that represents the time filter. The time filter is just what I see here. When I change from uh, give me data from the last minute or from one day to the other or from one hour to the other. So if I put here where time filter automatically, is going to synchronize this chart with that filter there without me having to do anything. So as you can see, simple uh, simple enough, but very powerful. I'm going to save the changes. And I want to show you a couple of other queries I'm using. The one for the maximum is super simple, as you should expect. It's just doing give me the maximum value and I want to group by sensor and I'm going to order by temperature descendant. So that's what I'm getting. If I'm going to the maximum temperature in the past 10 seconds, in this one, it's uh, the, the, other, the only interesting bit here is that I'm not actually using the time filter from the panel because I want to query always the last 10 seconds. So I'm just grouping the time, I'm binning the time, in 10 seconds intervals, and I'm just grouping by sensor ID and by that interval independently of the filters. So this chart is going to always show the last uh, 10 seconds, no matter what. So it's up to you if you want to link the data with the uh, filters or not. So as you can see, simple enough stuff, and same thing for the other table. In this particular query, things are a bit more interesting because I'm reading two different measures of the same table at the same time. So I have to pivot a little bit the columns, but eventually it's just SQL. I'm working with just a uh, SQL compatible with Amazon Time Stream. So you see, it's very simple and quite powerful to actually get data here. And it's, it's actually very real time. If I go to the script I have right now, sending synthetic data, and I stop sending data for a few seconds, I should see here, I should see I don't have data anymore. Data is not coming. The moment I start sending data again, 
almost immediately, I should see how here it is, how Grafana is catching up. So it's very real time. And if you see here, I'm also getting new readings for deceptions. So data was ingested, went to kinesis, and went to the analytics to detect complex event patterns. Lambda put that data on time stream, and I'm getting here the results. Super fast, super quick, super interesting. But that's not the only thing you can do. I told you, we already can query data. We also can query data from the data lake. So Ricardo created a table here, which is the uh, time series and data lakes table, in which I have data exported from time stream and into a stream. So I can query this data directly on Athena, which for me is super interesting, super convenient. By the way, I can also, uh, if I want, I can also, uh, let me ask for a second, I can show you all the partitions that Ricardo has created. Well, more than Ricardo Airflow. So I can show you all the partitions that Airflow created on this table. And here they are, partitions for every few minutes. But more interestingly for me, I have also a second database on this uh, account. I have a database which is called Sensor Customer Data. And I have some master data here. I have a few tables on this database. I have a table with customer data, and I have a table with mappings from sensors to customer IDs. Let me just show you on Athena what this looks like. So if I go to Athena, I have here the Sensor Customer Data uh, database. Let me just uh, reload. OK. And here, I have my customer data. I have only defined five customers. It is just fake data. So company name, contact person, and if the company is premium or basic. And I have also another table with a mapping between sensors and customers. So now I have this. I can start running joins. I could just do a simple join between the table coming from time stream into S3 and the sensor mappings. Oh, uh, what happened here? Select whatever from this. Yeah, it was not really an error. I believe I, I click on run before actually changing the tab. That's why I got the error. Sorry about that. So uh, as you can see here, I have the sensors and the customer ID. So I'm joining with mappings and getting the customer ID. So now I can run yet another query in which I'm joining all the data also with the customer table. So now I have here data uh, from the sensors matching with data from my customers. So the contact person, the company for this particular within. And instead of doing this query all the time, and also because I want to change the name of some columns and do some data conversions and so on, I have created a view in which I'm just doing this join and adding some uh, conditions and some conversions. So this column is going to be a timestamp and it's going to be called event time. This is going to be a cast as a double, it's going to be called temperature, blah, blah, blah. So with this, I create a view. And now I can query this view as if it was a single table. So I can select from this view and it's actually joining together the data I have coming from time stream into Airflow and the data I have on my data lake, which is already quite cool. And now I can use this for my business insights. So I have created a data set on QuickSight that is connecting to Athena to use this view. By the way, if you want, you can actually connect QuickSight directly to a time stream. So we have the option to connect directly when you create a new data set, you can connect directly to time stream. So if I wanted to read just the raw data from time stream into QuickSight, I could do that. But if I want to do joins with my data like data, I'm querying rather data from Athena so I can do a bit more interesting thing.
So I have my data source with uh, connected with Athena. So once I have my uh, my data source, I can run, I can create dashboards. And this is how you will do it. Instead of having to write SQL queries, you only have to point and click. Let me just come here and show you. I want to create a new visualization. And for this visualization, I'm going to be using the event time and the temperature. And this automatically is going to select the best chart for me. And it's going to uh, to decide which to create, of course. I can add, while it's loading data, I can also add filters if I want. So in my in my particular case, I already created the analysis with some filters. I have here some parameters, uh, the date from and to and the companies. So I have here some filters that I apply in to my um, to my visualizations. So in this particular case, I'm going to be filtering only for this company, or I'm going to be filtering only for the time range I have between these two parameters. So I can add filters easily. I can change anything I want from my charts, but eventually creating uh, charts that way, you can actually have interesting visualizations. In this particular way, in this particular panel, I'm showing right now, I'm going to go only for one of the companies because it's easier to see. So I'm going to show data only for my customer called AWS. And for this particular data, I see things like uh, the top company name. In this particular case, I have only a company. Of course, it's AWS. The median temperature was uh, the median temperature was from it changed from ninety three to one hundred percent and increased seven point sixty nine percent. The highest second in this time range was this particular time point in time and temperature was one hundred eighty and the minimum was ten. Here, I can read the median temperature together with the uh, maximum. Here, I have the information about the customer and the company. Here, I have the number of, uh, you know, the events with the number of errors and the different sensors and how many reads per sensor I have for this particular company. So as you can see here, pretty basic stuff, but I can create a dashboard as complex as I want, just querying data that I have on my uh, time stream database exported to S3, joining with the data I have already on the data lake. So basically, you have no silos in the company, and you can query all your data from a single uh, place. You can do it either with Grafana for more interactive geeky analytics, or with QuickSight for more business-like uh, analytics. I finished the demo I had created for you. I hope it was interesting. And hopefully, after this, you'll have a few takeaways from this session. The first one, if you are working with time series, it's not really easy to work with a traditional database. You can do it. We've done it before. It was not really convenient. So that's why we created Amazon Time Stream to help you with that. But just having the database sometimes is not enough. Of course, depending on what you are doing, time stream is all you need. But if you want to pre-process, transform your data, run other type of analytics before ingesting into uh, Amazon time stream, then you can use a streaming. And as you saw today, you can do fairly complex processing with very, very, very low latency end to end. It's always important to have the raw data. Even if you are doing analytics down the line, if you have the raw data, you can always go back and recreate any complex pattern. You can always go back and do maybe harder analytics on batch rather than real time. So having the raw data is always interesting to have around. When you are doing these complex workflows, you don't want to do that by hand. And automating, automating that with the scripts might also be difficult. So orchestrating is key to move your data across the different tools. And of course, as we saw on the last part, if you join your time series data with your data link data, there is nothing you cannot analyze in your company. You have 
the whole data there, the whole story, and you can use it in any way you want to move your business forward. If you want to reproduce everything we did today, you can find the code we used in the demo in Danilo's repository. You have there the link, and by all means, please send any feedback if you have it. I want to thank you very much for your time. And there you are, our Twitter accounts. If you have any suggestions, any questions, any feedback, we are more than happy to take it. Thank you.